Hello everybody, today we are at Warwick Bushland Reserve in Perth, a bushland reserve remnant in the city of Perth in southwestern Australia. We are here with Professor Mark Brundret, an adjunct at the University of Western Australia. And we are here because uh, we want to talk about uh, orchids and interactions, their interactions with uh, fungi. Mark, how long uh, have you been working into orchids? Um, well, for most of my life, I suppose. When I was a young lad living with my family in Africa for a couple of years, we were given orchids to look after, and I spent some time uh, drawing them and getting to know them better. And um, since then, I've had numerous opportunities to work on them, and with both as a hobby and also as scientific projects. Um, most recently, working as in the wheat belt orchid rescue project where we studied orchid conservation for some very rare orchids. At the moment there's a lot of work being done on some rare sun orchids in the Queen of Sheba complex that I'm helping with as well. Mm. So let's talk about the fungi. Uh, why fungi uh, fungi are so important for the orchids? Well I don't know if any of you have seen orchid seeds before but they're incredibly small they're like dust which means that they have no store of energy. So most plants can live in the soil, their seeds can survive in the soil for long periods of time, because they just slowly use up their energy, but orchid seeds can't do that. So wherever they fall, the wind blows them around, and wherever they fall, they have to germinate or die, and the, they can't germinate without energy provided by a fungus. And it's not any fungus, it's a particular fungus which is compatible with that orchid. Um, there's a range of different fungi that different genera often have different types of orchid fungi, but they're all related and called rhizoctonias in a general sense. Mm. And uh, I'm also very curious uh, to know about uh, w the requirements of these fungi. So w the, the fungi, what, uh, what do they need uh, for uh, being uh, in the soil? Because we are talking about uh, terrestrial orchids, uh, mm -hmm. and so the, the fungi are, of course, in the soil. And uh, what uh, really, do, did you discover what uh, are their needs, uh, their requirements in particular? Well, actually, it's a bit of a mystery. We know that they're in the orchid um, seedlings, uh, the protocorms, and, and they're obligately required by the orchid pro protocorms, but also the adult orchids have them in their stem or their roots. Um, and we, we know that wherever the orchids are thriving, the fungus must be very active. So we can use orchid seed baiting, which is using putting some orchid seed with the soil to find if that orchid is present. And we've done that in Warwick, and we found quite a lot of the soil samples have a range of different orchid mycorrhizal fungi in them. But um, regarding what the fungus is doing in the soil, no one actually knows. But I would say it's probably really important to have a healthy ecosystem, especially with a lot of soil, organ soil organic matter. I did an experiment quite a few years ago where we separated the soil into mineral and organic fractions, and the orchid fungus was only in the coarse organic material. So um, that's another property of healthy ecosystems is lots of organic material. And that's probably what the fungi and the orchids need to survive. Mm. So interesting. Thanks. Uh, but uh, to, in these days, uh, there is uh, actually just started uh, an orchid species, which is uh, Telemitra fusculatea, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we are going to see now in flower. Um, and possibly, uh, are you going to do some work uh, on the interaction with the fungi uh, about this species? Yes, yeah, so well, next year we're planning to do some soil baiting studies with a whole bunch of different sun orchids, including some very rare ones, but we want to use the common orchids. Well, this isn't really that common anymore in Perth, but it can be, we can sample soil from near it without doing it any harm, and we can use that soil from this sun orchid and, and other sun orchids. We've got about five other, six other species here to isolate any uh, fung fungus or a group of fungi, which we believe will germinate most or all the other sun orchids and that would include the rare ones like the Queen of Sheba, which we're trying to propagate in the lab at the moment. So yes, the idea is to use common orchids to provide fungi for the rare ones as a surrogates, I suppose, uh, mm. to help with the rescue of rare orchids. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mark, for sharing uh, your knowledge. Uh, now we're gonna, <laughs> we're gonna see um, some, uh, some of these orchids in flower here around. So can you guide us? <laughs> well. You can see quite a few. <laughs> so we're, yeah. in the, we're in the middle. <coughs> sorry, we're in the middle of the habitat. <coughs> we're currently in the middle of the habitat where they occur, 
and um, there's a clump over there and a clump over here and um, more over there probably so if we get your eye in you'll see this little it's very beautiful but it's also quite small um, brown sun orchid that that's very late flowering it, it it's actually in November flowering in Perth and um, we're trying to find out what the pollinator is that's <laughs> Danielle and I are working on that next because it we don't really know we just know that it has a very low rate of pollination I've been monitoring its seed set now for about a decade and um, if we're lucky five percent of the flowers will set a seed pod which is enough I suppose because it is spreading in numbers probably are stable here mm. but it's not re really wonderful and we'd like to know if something's missing from the ecosystem where it's just always been a low pollinated species yeah there are so many interactions that we need to discover yeah. about uh, this species but uh, also other species here in southwestern australia which you know is on a spot of biodiversity with over 400 species of orchids uh, and here in warwick reserve how many do you reckon there are well we've got over 30 now so ah, there's over 30. yeah some of them haven't been seen for a few years and this year we found a couple new ones that we didn't know about so it's yeah every year we find at least one new one which seems to blow in on, with its seed from somewhere else. And occasionally some of the ones that we found in the past have disappeared, but yeah, at the moment there'd be over 30 species of, or of orchids here. Wow, hmm. that's great. So just uh, uh, let's go to, to see some, uh, some orchids uh, in the vicinity. So here we are in front of a plant of a Telemitra um, uh, fusculatea. It's a really beautiful uh, species. Uh, Mark, is the one that are you investigating for the fun fungi interaction? Yeah, um, we're studying the pollination and the, as well of, of this uh, orchid. So what, what I've been doing for about the last 10 years is counting how many of these orchids appear, where they appear, and um, how many of the flowers turn into a seed capsule. So in this case, um, this one's been here for quite a few years, at least five or six, may not flower every year, but, um, but what we have dis discovered is that um, only about one flower out of 20 actually sets a seed pod. So it's become um, quite low levels of pollination, but it still seems to work reasonably well because there are more, there are about the same number of orchids growing here now as they were at the start of the study, but they're popping up in different places and disappearing from some other places as well. Um, mm. And uh, How many years uh, have you studied this, the reproductive data of this species? So have you counted the, the fruit set uh, for how many years? Uh? Well, in this case, it'd be about seven years in detail, but there's some observations going back for um, much more than that in terms of where the plants were. Um, so we've been monitoring them for most, almost 20 years in terms of the numbers and how they slowly spread. So what we've learned is that you need a fairly large intact nature reserve for, to keep species like this in the wild because um, the areas where we found them first, they're not there anymore. They've moved quite a long distance away from the first ones we found, um, gradually spreading in different directions and um, they just need lots of space and it's good condition bushland like this is what they need. Mm. This is also called a um, sun orchid in general because it's part of the Telemitra genus and uh, which is the, tip the, characteristic, the main characteristic of these uh, uh, sun orchids? Well, like all sun orchids, it's got flowers that are radially symmetrical. That is, all the, the petals and sepals look very similar. Um, oh, yeah. There's no distinct labellum that you can see on the lowest yeah, petal. All tepals, so. Yeah, they're all tepals. And, um, they're almost all the same size and the similar markings and patterns. The sun orchids are very, quite often have quite special, um, and quite spectacular markings on them, um, especially when you get up close. And in the middle, there's a column which has got a very complicated fringe on it as well, which yeah. we don't know why it's, it's there, the but white, um, yeah. yeah, it starts with this white. Uh, yes, that's stuff that's there. the white yeah. fringe. Yes, yeah. um, and that also contains the pollen under it um, and the the receptive surface where the pollen has to be t to be returned to so we know that this needs an insect to pollinate it but we haven't observed many insects visiting these flowers so 
there's work to be done on this orchid. Um, um, and the other obvious thing about sun orchids, for most of them, they won't open unless it's a sunny day. That's where their name comes from. So uh, today it's just barely warm enough, but I yeah. think it's starting to close on us now. <laughs> yeah. So we are here just in time to appreciate this beauty. Thank you very much, Mark, uh, for uh, the opportunity to listen these amazing things you are doing. And uh, I yeah, look forward to, to receiving some updates uh, for the future. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you. I'm looking forward to working with you on more of these um, pollination projects so oh. we can work out what's actually happening. Thank you very much, Mark, for sharing uh, this amazing knowledge. Look forward to working with you again and um, yeah, see you next time. Thanks, Danielle. I'll see you soon. <laughs>